after a week of doing this new normal, so to speak, to um, have a discussion with you guys. And I know that there's uh, interest in what's going on and, uh, here. I'm uh, really grateful to our medical people, uh, especially to Dr. Burchard, who is our chief medical officer, but really to our whole medical staff that have done an incredible job in so many ways. Number one, in all the investigation, research, um, best practices, whether it be with our fellow Big Ten schools or you know, pro franchises in the area or around the world. Um, I think it's been an exhaustive effort by them to put together the best plan possible. Um, I think it's very, uh, real to say you cannot reduce risk to zero, that, that we all understand. Um, how can we prepare for a season and try to keep the risk as low as we can? Well, we think we've put together a, a uh, series of routines that need to become ritual for us um, when you have a group this size, coaches, staff, um, there's definitely growing. You have to grow, understanding, you know, the importance of the big three, right? Social distancing, the mask, and washing your hands. As simple as that sounds, all of us in, in this new normal have found out that you can easily forget. You can make a mistake uh, when you're in a large group of people. A uh, mistake can have a bigger effect, though, right? When you, when you make a mistake and it's just you and your home, that's different. So... We have tried to do uh, everything that we can to present as safe an opportunity for our players and our coaches and our staff. That's been my number one goal all along since this, uh, <clears throat> this pandemic hit the United States. Um, I think our players have done an incredible job in the time that they were away. They are trying to get used to this new normal and are doing better every day. And we have to hold each other accountable. That's actually one where I was running up from is I just wanted to talk to a group of guys. It's very important that, uh, that we hold each other accountable. We have a saying in our program, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, it's a little bit uncomfortable to say to somebody, Hey, come on, put your mask on or you know, back off. But we have to do that. And, um, I think people are getting more and more accustomed to doing that and it's necessary. So um, we did have an extensive round of testing, actually three rounds of testing. We had uh, a round of testing before our athletes returned to campus. So if they were um, out of the area, we did mail order. Um, if they were in the area, they came by and we did it. Then on uh, and getting my days confused. I guess Monday the 15th, we tested the entire team and coaching staff, everybody involved in the program. And now today we had our first follow-up test. From those tests, we had um, two positives. Um, one of the positives never made it to campus. He, got, he, he was told to stay at home. Um, the other positive did was negative on the first test and then positive on the, on the second. So uh, due to that positive, we've had uh, three people in our program quarantine plus the positive, so four people total, um, which that quarantine after today's testing, uh, hopefully some of those guys will be uh, freed back up to do, to do things with the group. Um, it's certainly uncharted territory, right? We all know that. I'm not a medical professional. I've spent a heck of a lot of time on WebExes, phone calls, and conference calls with medical professionals from all over the country and all over the globe. But um, to say we have the answers, I mean, that would be that would be an arrogant statement. We are trying to do our best um, with all the information that we have. I can tell you that our administration has done whatever we need to do to be able to get this done. Um, I think, again, Dr. Burchard and his people, uh, 
Dr. Womack and Dr. Stofiak. I mean, just an incredible job. Our trainers, incredible job. As you can imagine, the testing and all the administration of all this stuff is an incredible amount of work. So we keep moving forward, and uh, that's where we sit now. I'll gladly answer some questions. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on things that I'm not qualified to answer, so i just say that up front, but uh, I'll answer to the best of my knowledge. Thanks, Coach. We'll start with Keith Sargent, NJ.com. Hey, Greg. How are you? Good, sir. Um, how are you doing? Okay. Um, obviously, you're not the only pro program reporting cases. About uh, two dozen other schools have, and some have as many as 30 players in isolation. What are your thoughts today about seven weeks before training camp on whether to play the season in the fall or push it back to the spring? Well, there's really two questions there, right? We have, we have um, several programs that have reported. There's some programs that aren't reporting their, their positives. I felt it was important that we did report our positives um, for a lot of reasons. One, to help everybody else. I think we're all in this together. I think that's an understatement, right? So we need to share information. We need to be uh, very open about that. Um, as far as when to play the season, that, that starts getting outside of my expertise. Um, I can't really comment on that because I don't know all the factors involved. What I've tried to tell our team is this. Right now, we're told that we're going to have a season that opens that weekend of the 5th, and we're going to prepare for that date. And if that date changes, then we'll pivot and we will make another plan. And I think, you know, until there's some real substantive <laughs> medical science that, that uh, you know, we come up with a vaccine or we come up with a, with a, uh, a treatment plan that really limits the death from this virus, I think we're all going to be trying to figure it out as we go. You know, one of the one of the people that I'm very close to says, you know, we're we're building the airplane in midair. So it takes a lot of work and a lot of people uh, really working hard to try to do what's best with the knowledge that we have. So I, I I'm just trying to get get through today. You know, we got our tests done today. I'm waiting for the results on that. Meanwhile, trying to run a football program, it's uh, it's a challenging time. But not, you know, I say that. It's a challenging time. Thank God so far, um, everybody's safe. And, you know, people that have lost loved ones, that's a real challenging time. So, um, you know, my heart is, it goes out to them. Chris Eisman, Nick Annette. Hi, Greg. How are you? Well, how are you, Chris? Good, thank you. Um, I know, you know you guys are obviously been communicating with the families of players, and, and how important has that communication been, you know, with parents and, and family members, and how important is that going to be going forward to kind of ease their concerns about having their sons back on campus and obviously not at home as they had been for the past few months? I think it's really important, and especially, you know, being a parent of four, uh, I know my interest level would be extremely high, right? I want to know what the details are. We had a very lengthy, we actually had two very lengthy calls, one with the guys who came on the on the um, 15th, and now we have another group of high school fr freshmen that are reporting today that will be kept separate, right? So they'll, they've been through the same procedure, two tests. They will be kept separate in a different dorm, quarantined until their second test clears, and then they'll be infused into the, uh, into the rest of the team. So I had a long, a lengthy call with them on Friday night last. Um, so unfortunately, I'm getting pretty good at those uh, calls. Um, but you know what? As a, as a parent, I want to know what's going on. And then, I, you know, the, the big thing is that this is a voluntary period right now. And I make it clear that no one is required to be here. So if they're not comfortable, and that goes for staff as well. I, I think, um, you know, if they're not comfortable being here, uh, Certainly, that's their option not to be here. And we'll do it, uh, you know, via remote. So, you know, we're still using a lot of the remote mechanisms with the players as well. So it's just got to just got to keep moving forward step by step. Thank you, James Branch, mm -hmm. NJ.com. Greg, 
I, I guess to pay back what you said about being a, a father, um, you have two sons that play college football. I mean, how have you kind of approached, how has this whole process educated you and how you kind of work with them as they kind of head into, I know it's a different level, their upcoming season? Well, you're right. It, it is a different level, but um, you know, right now they're preparing as if they have a season. Now they're doing it from home. They're not on campus, you know. Um, but you know, I've I've told them that, that they need. You know, we've educated them on all the things that we're doing here, right? And I mean, it's nothing that hasn't been publicly said all over the place. Is social distancing, masks, wash your hands, but. Again, I think it's so easy to say and much, much harder to, to comply with continuously. Um, as far as the sport, you know there's risks, right? Because you're going to be in close proximity. You're going to, that's, that's a fact. Are you willing to take those risks? That's what each individual has to decide. Um, the positive is that the, um, the effects it have on healthy 18 to 22 year olds is much different than the effects it has on people my age and older. So that's the one, you know, when I look at it as a parent, I feel much, I feel a lot of comfort in that fact alone. Um, might they get sick? They might, yeah, they might get sick. Um, but all the information that I've received is that's not going to be, uh, or hasn't been, I should say, led to death. Now, that's scary to even say, right? If, if, that, if I thought that for a minute, I would not only have my own son's nor would I have uh, anybody's son playing if I thought that was that was a there's any probability you know of that but um, it's definitely an individual and probably a family decision as far as what what people want to do Bobby Darren Bobby here on you Bobby, you're on mute. Can you hear us? Uh, sorry, you got me now? Yes. We got you. Sorry, my connection is kind of bad, Coach. I apologize. Um, as far as the voluntary workouts, what do they entail and how different are they with these measures in place? It's mostly Jay Butler's work. You know, we, we still have meetings with the players um, via WebEx. I know that there's players that come in to see their coaches individually. Um, again, with the proper masks and, and such. Um, but it's, it's really that they're training together. You know, the summer training that occurs, um, that's the biggest difference is they're now together doing it. See you, Pudi. Hey, Greg, as I'm looking around the country and seeing everything that's happening in different places and, and knowing what you have to go through just to get to the point where you can get kids in camp. I'm starting to wonder, you know, why are we doing this? Does, does part of you, you know, wonder if this is the right thing to do to play college football season under these circumstances? Well, I think that goes back to Keith's question, right? And I'm, I don't think I'm really um, qualified to say the answer to that. I am qualified to say my own comfort level right now. And if I wasn't comfortable, I wouldn't be here. Forget having anybody's children here. I wouldn't be here. Um, I've made it voluntary or optional to everybody, which is the rule number one. But it's also, uh, it needs to be expressed that they, they don't need to be here if they don't want to be here or they don't feel safe being here. Uh, there are some players that didn't return. that felt they'd be better off staying where they were. And uh, certainly that, that is their prerogative. And there'll be a time as we move forward that there is what they call a mandatory period. And, you know, if you choose not to come then, then it's a different, you know, story. Your question as far as why are we doing this, I think we're doing, I think this thing, you know, I was listening to somebody, whether it's right or wrong, I was listening to somebody that says we're in the early stages. So, um, I don't know. Do you just put everything on, on permanent hold? Those are all questions that are, you know, above my above my knowledge. And I'm trying to get knowledge on this, but much like you guys, and I know some of you have been covering the virus, so you probably have a better outlook on it than I do. 
you try to gather as much information as you can, and that's what I've been trying to do. Um, but even then, it's hard to figure out what's right and what's wrong, and what's real and what's not. So there's definitely, I know there is a science to it, but it's hard for an individual, even with all the resources that I have, listening to people, it's hard to really know what is 100% right. You just have to go on what you think's right today, and that's what I'm doing. And uh, if there came a day where I didn't think it was right, I would say that as well. And do you think it'll be different, Chris Nowalski? Hey, Coach, uh, kind of more on the field question for you, but, um, you know, what What made you uh, bring in Noah Vedula quarterback uh, as a grad transfer? Uh, I think Noah really fits what we want to do offensively very well. Um, you know, he's an experienced guy. He's got two years of eligibility remaining. He is a very mature guy. He's a talented guy. He... Um, has the skill set that I think can fit well into what we're doing as well as the experience. So that was the reason. There was a, you know, um, when he went into the portal, we have a system when guys go in the portal, uh, it goes immediately through a channel. And um, when I watched him that evening, I knew right away we wanted to try to get him on our team if we could. I didn't have any idea what his thoughts were. So it was a, a two week process that kind of. <clears throat> went back and forth and then ended up with him coming here. So uh, he's a great addition to the team. Uh, I think there'll be a tremendous quarterback competition in training camp. And, uh, you know, it's our job. It's their job to perform and it's our job to go figure out, you know, what, what is the best decision for our team. Tom Canavan. Hey, Greg. Of the guys who tested positive, will they be allowed to – voluntarily work out if they pass the second test or would you prefer they just stay away for a while? Well, there's a whole regimen or uh, that, that the medical people have set up, right? So upon a positive, um, some of the things that are significant, was it an asymptomatic positive or was it a symptomatic positive? Um, and that dictates some of the windows of time. Uh, again, they have to be able to pass the test period, no matter how much time to be able to, you know, I've learned a lot about this stuff. You know, you can have persistent positive tests for a while. Um, so then they have the antibody test to make sure that you're at a certain level. There's a lot of things that go into it, but rest assured that once there is a positive, uh, those players will go through the protocol to return, which is, is, uh, I think really good. And, um, <clears throat> those that, you know, when, when you do the tracing, those people that were put into quarantine, um, they have to be retested and, and be negative before they can be added back into the population. So I do have confidence, like I said earlier, I think our docs did a great job of setting up the entire program. Uh, the hardest thing is daily compliance by all of us. Right? We have to, have to, have to hold each other accountable. And you know what? I, I think, you know, some people have said this. Probably the best people to start re-entry are athletes, right? Because they're used to following kind of a, a system and, and holding each other accountable. But I can tell you that it's um, it's a challenge that we have to all stay on top of. And I don't just mean the coaches. I mean every player. You know, I've I've really expressed to them we have to hold each other accountable because I'm I could just as likely forget to put my mask on as as you know the the sixteen right guard. It doesn't matter. Um, we all have to hold each other accountable. Is that New York Post? Um, Greg, there, there's been talk of potentially playing the season in the spring. What What are your thoughts on on if that happened? What that would be like? And is that something you're in favor of or opposed to? Well, I'm not in favor or opposed to. You know, I don't. Again, I don't know the enough of what it all entails medically, scientifically, as well as from an athletic standpoint. I know this, that we will pivot and be ready to do whatever um, the Big Ten Conference and the NCAA determine is the best way to go. Um, that's our job. That's what I am uh, paid to do. Um, as far as what's, what's how I feel and what's best, I think that's better left to them because those are the guys that are going to make decisions, not me. Um, 
I just want to make sure that whatever we're whatever they give us as the goal or the aiming point, that we're ready to go when that happens. What do you think spring football would be like? Uh, I don't think it would be much different. I mean, obviously the the season would be different, but uh, I think one thing we've learned in all of this is that you know we're a highly adaptable group of people, and we would adapt. You know, I, don't just, I don't just mean Rutgers football. I mean all of us, right? I mean look at what what. Everyone in the state of New Jersey has been able to do, um, and really everybody in our country, what we've been able to do, whether it's good or bad. You know, we need to we need to keep do, doing those three things. The, the big thing that I've learned is those three things. You know, as basic and simple as they sound, they're critical. I mean, that that is the until we get a scientific solution, those are the critical behavioral solutions we have to do. Mark Narducci, Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, Craig, um, you've had a, a, a good time recruiting already, and it's been tough. How, how tough has this been uh, with the pandemic, and yet you've been able to get a lot of commitments? Well, I think this staff has done a very good job in the recruiting. Um, part of that is the staff that we hired. They have uh, good relationships in the areas that we recruit. Uh, the other part is the people they are and the ability they have to form relationships and to build relationships that are meaningful. So we are very particular about the type of athlete and the type of person that we want to bring into our program. So, and it's always been that way, that we don't necessarily always go after the same people that everybody does. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but that's our call, that's our decision, not uh, not anybody else's. Um, I think our guys have done a great job of locking in on the guys that we believe are the right people for Rutgers football and then going all in. Incredible amount of effort, you know, in, in recruiting. There's no substitute for hard work. Um, it's hard work to develop a relationship with people you don't know, but you do it. And um, we just need to keep doing it because recruiting is the life lifeline of your program. I learned a, a long, long time ago, it's it's about players, not plays. So any coach that believes, look, I don't downplay the significance of good schematic or technique coaching. I think it's very important. But you can do the best schematic and technique coaching in the world. If you don't have the players, it's not going to make a hill of beans difference. So what we need to do is continue to recruit year after year after year and fill the pipeline with very talented players. What happens then is competition becomes fierce. Players begin to come out of the other end of the pipeline and go to the National Football League, which spurs on better players entering the pipeline. And it's an ongoing process. So that's that's how I look at it, and that's what I mean when I say it's the lifeline of your program. Patrick, Press of Atlantic City. Yes, hi, Coach. How are you? Um, I'm doing well. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So I want to kind of shift the gear away from, you know, the Kessel positive and things people are talking about. For me, a big interest is um, local players, especially I cover a lot of high school sports, and down in our area, the Atlantic, Cape May counties, um, there's been a lot of local interest since you took over the program. We have a lot of kids that switch their transfers and are going there next year. Kids are already committing that are going to be seniors in high school this year. First of all, I want to know, are you aware of your presence right now that kids are really wanting to go look at Rutgers because of you? And um, how are you going to continue that interest, um, especially taking on a program that hasn't really done well last year? You have some more kids to do to bring that program up the, back to the standards that it was in the past. So how are you going to keep that interest growing, um, especially locally? Well, I think, you know, like I said earlier, the development and uh, – the growth of relationships with both coaches, players, young kids, knowing about every kid, you know, our staff in the state of New Jersey should know about every young kid from the seventh, sixth, seventh grade up. I mean, we should be recruiting and building relationships with these kids for years that when it comes time to make a decision, now that's the long game. And right? I mean, if you think of it that way, but that's the way we did it our first go around. And that's the way we'll continue to do it. Um, you know, in our first go around, it took a while for Rutgers to crack into South Jersey. And then when it happened, it was huge. Well, I think we've jumped right in the beginning. You know, Fran Brown has done an incredible job down in South Jersey. 
uh, along with some of our other coaches. And, you know, that's critical because we need to have the whole state of New Jersey like we did in the, in the last few years of our tenure here in the first go around. So I feel like we've picked right up where we left off then. And uh, that's going to be critical because what a great football playing state we have. We have to be able to draw from the entire state. And then you throw New York City into that. You know, New York City, Staten Island, Long Island, those are important, important places. Again, we need to know every kid that's up and coming. And because those are our kids, that'll be the bulk, the heart of our team. Will we recruit elsewhere? Sure, we will. You know, but the, every year you know that the heart of our team will come from the, that circle around Rutgers. And we call it the state of Rutgers, and that's why we do. We have time for one more question. We'll go to Robin, News 12. Hey, Coach. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, we're in uncharted territories. You have way more to worry about now than you ever have before. How are you personally just dealing with all of this and uh, remaining a good leader for these players? I appreciate you asking that, Robin. That's a, that's a really good question. Sometimes I feel like I'm not. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job. Um, because it's just so much to keep track of. Uh, I have really good people that work with us, and I mentioned the medical people and our trainers, but I think our assistant coaches and all the support staff that work with them have done an incredible job, whether it's moving guys into dorms or tracking them at home. Will Gilkison, who is our uh, associate, uh, associate athletic director for football, um, you know, was a captain for me back in 2005. Recruited him when he was a 16-year-old kid. I mean, his life is Rutgers. And he and his staff, the operations people, you can imagine everything that they've done. Matt Colgiovanni, who works in the athletic department, incredible. He and his staff, you know, things you never think about. You know, building plastic things in front of the desks of the, of the assistants that sit outside, you know making sure that the person that monitors entrance has something built for them for their safety. I mean, the, the number of things are endless that have to be thought of. And then even when you do that, there's still things that come up. So, um, Robin, what you asked is, is, you know, working really, really hard, trying to think ahead, see around the curves, but inevitably there's things you can't see and you just try to do your best. And I think that, uh, we have a really good group of people here that want to do the right thing. It's not always easy to do it, so we just have to keep holding each other accountable. That's kind of been my big message is, you know, here are the instructions. Now we got to hold each other accountable to execute this thing. And uh, they're a great, fun group to be around. And I got to tell you, it was really cool to have everybody kind of getting back around each other. I know we've been doing it like we're doing right now, but it's good to see these guys and to have one-on-one -on -one conversations and, I don't know where it's all going. Uh, hopefully we're going to end up having a, a great season and, and America is going to have something to, to get behind. You know, that's my prayers, but uh, most importantly that people stay safe and we do the right thing. So but thanks for asking, Robin. That's all we have time for today. Thanks, Coach. Thanks.